What is going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Dave Brown. I'm a big chocolate lover. I hope you are as well, because this episode is brought to you by Lyft Chocolate. And Lyft Chocolate is a veteran-owned company. And again, they make some of the best chocolates that you'll ever have, some of the best chocolates around. Barb and I are big fans. Uh, they've been featured on Forbes, Food Network, and Thrive Global. Uh, and the founder, the candy man, Brandon Bush, is a big supporter in all that we do here at American Snippets. And we want to support him as well. So go to liftchocolate.com and order some of these delicious chocolates today. Uh, so let's get into this week's episode. On April 15th, 2013, the country watched in horror as the Boston Marathon became the scene of a terrorist attack. And for months, the media uh, followed this story, including the story of Rebecca Gregory, who was critically injured in the attack. And in this very special episode of American Snippets, Rebecca openly shares the emotional story of that day as she and her five-year-old son survived being three feet from the bomb. She shares her insight and strength on the road to her recovery, as well as her nonprofit, Rebecca's Angels, which was established to support other trauma survivors. So without further ado, here is Barbara Allen with Rebecca Gregory. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. Today, I get to sit down with my new but great friend, Rebecca Gregory. I just met Rebecca a couple months ago. Feels like I've known her forever. I say that in a good way. She might be like, it feels like I've known Barb forever. <laughs> but, but I hope not. Rebecca um, is just incredible for so many reasons. I'm not going to waste time popping around with things coming out of my mouth. I'm going to get right into it with Rebecca. Thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Well, first of all, it's an honor <laughs> to be your friend, Barb. So I, I've enjoyed the uh, last flavorful, flavorful <laughs> couple of months with you. It's been, it's been very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you have a lot going on in your life too. And we're going to get to all that in a minute. But let's talk back. We were just talking before we started recording. You have so many layers to your story. And I mean, this one episode, we're just not going to be able to get into all of them. Um, mm -hmm. But for those of you that want a little more, I'm looking at my German Shepherd who's about to take my laptop down, getting into the wires over there. Woody. Whoa. Well, my it's sign fell down, fell down you know, okay. right before. So. Yes. So here we go. We're just leaving that in. That's real shit. Um, so anyway, so even we're not going to be able to get into all of Rebecca's story here today, but I'm going to encourage everybody right off the bat to get her book. Um, Rebecca, talk about your book real quick, um, the title and where they get sure, it. It's, it's, a... uh, it's taking my life back on uh, my story of faith, determination and surviving the Boston Marathon bombing. So it's a really complicated title, but it's essentially just kind of a walkthrough of my life uh, prior to the bombing and then yeah. everything I kind of learned afterwards. Yeah. So I'm going to tell you this. This episode is this interview is just going to be enough to get you wanting more because it's an incredible, incredible story. So let's talk about, um, we could start it at, at, let's talk about the days leading up to your decision to attend the Boston Marathon. Sure. So I, I think we've had that conversation about intuition before too. Yeah. And I look back on those couple of days prior and I was just to set the scene a little bit. I was a corporate housing manager. So I provided temporary housing for people across the country. I set that up for them and we always had this big quota to meet. And it was one of those jobs that was just constant stress. And so I was at work every night so late. And I had planned this trip because I was dating someone whose mom had qualified to run the Boston Marathon. And it happened to me my 26th birthday weekend. And I had never been to Boston before. And I was like, I'm going to bring my, my five-year-old son and we're going to have this amazing time. And I needed it in my life because at that point, I felt like I was just kind of burning the candle at both ends. But I remember specifically just glancing at my phone the night before the trip, 
I probably almost canceled about 10 times, just getting on my phone and almost putting in cancel on my plane tickets and not going at all. Cause I was living in Texas at the time. So it was, it was a long way. It was a lot to do. And I, for whatever reason, I still went. <laughs> yeah. So you have that kind of gut feeling. So where was your, your boyfriend? He was also in Texas. He was in New York. So we were dating long distance at the time. I had just met him. I don't know, a couple, maybe a little over a couple months. So probably like five months before the marathon. And it had gotten pretty serious, pretty fast, because I knew if I was going to date someone that was so far away, it needed to be that way. But I just always had these feelings that there wasn't that connection there that should have been there. There were different red flags, but it was nevertheless kind of exciting. And I was new to Texas. I had moved from Kentucky. I was just kind of at a weird place in my life and it, it felt good at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know all about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you squelch those feelings where you tell yourself, ah, stop being crazy. Just yeah. get on the plane. Just You're go. Not, just go. Like, what do you think? Like, you just you just dismiss all those things. You tell yourself mm -hmm. that you're crazy. You get on the plane, you go. Now you have your five-year-old son with you. You're standing on the side of the street there, cheering yeah. people on. Your son's with you. Was your boyfriend with you there? He was. We had a group of about nine people with us that were cheering on our runner. So we started out at the 17-mile marker and we're holding up our signs. And it was really amazing because I had never been exposed to that kind of atmosphere before. I wasn't a runner. Everyone always thinks that I was the one at the Boston Marathon running. And I'm like, no, no, no. I was the one on the sidelines eating chocolate covered pretzels, yeah. wondering why anyone runs like that for fun. <laughs> and I just remember thinking like, how cool is this that so many people have trained so hard and they're so committed to it. And so one person in our group said, Hey, no, we need to go down to the finish line because we need to see our runner cross. And we all thought it was a great idea. And of course, no one tells you that when you go to watch a marathon, you end up running the same marathon, trying to keep up with them. And not only that, but I was trying to keep up with my five-year-old little boy, Noah. So we made our way down to where the finish line was. We were in a fantastic spot right in the middle of the action. And we could see every runner go across the finish line with these looks of just pure accomplishment and pride on their faces. And Noah just got really bored because there's only so many runners that an adult can watch cross the finish yeah. line. And I know that at that point I was kind of over it too. And he kept tugging on my clothes, mom, mom, when are we going to leave mom? I'm so bored. And I just kept thinking, I'm like, okay, I've got to keep him in one place. I want to be able to watch what we came here to watch too. And so I said, buddy, why don't you sit down on my feet and play in the rocks? Like you're a scientist. And of course there were no rocks. We're on asphalt, but to a five-year-old. I five think that's old, my favorite part of it right yeah. there. Play with the rocks. I mean, just, yeah, it's, just pretend. It's, exactly. It was like, yeah. I had to totally use my imagination right. in him too, because we're in this huge crowd and everybody is just surrounding you and screaming and cheering. It's just chaos. And he sat down, thank God. And he was right at my feet with his back up against my shins when a bomb and a backpack went off three feet behind us. I mean, right there in those moments, you have so many minute details that would have change everything if he didn't sit down if you were facing a little bit one way askew mm -hmm. instead of the other i mean all of those things came into play where i know a lot of people would be like you know there's no blessing involved in any of this but i look at it i'm like that's like that's blessings right there <laughs> you i mean yeah. inches inches are what made the difference there between you deciding to stand one way moments between you having that idea to just, hey, pretend there's some rocks down there, buddy, uh, you know, and sit there mm -hmm. and then lean up against your legs like like a mom does, you know, just 
just take it. Just stand there, let them lean yeah. up against your legs and and go. And that happened within minutes of the of the explosion. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't have been very long before it at all. And I do think about that. You know, we can look at every situation in our lives and whether or not we see it then, yeah. we can see blessings at some point. And when I look back, I think about why in the world did I have that thought to put him down at my feet? Right. And I could have easily said, hey, sit right beside me. Or picked him and up. If, or or picked him up yeah. or anything. Yeah. And I mean, and then I think about, you know, we found out that they had a drill, a bombing drill in Boston the year prior to that. And so with as crazy and unforeseen as that was, the fact that they were as ready as right. possible, that's another huge blessing. But, you know, for me, my biggest one is the fact that Noah did sit down and I was able to take everything from the bomb, the nails, the ball bearings, the, the shrapnel, the metal, and into the back of my legs and torso and left hand. And that's what shielded him. And that's why my son will turn 14 in August and is doing amazing. That's that's. I think that's awesome. And I just look at all those little moments. I, sometimes I, I over obsess on those little moments that I break them down and I just try to understand. I, I think it's me just yeah. trying to understand things like why, you know, why or how or all these things. But so for me, when I break them down, I'm able to find those moments. So in the aftermath of this explosion, now it goes off. You're really, really badly wounded. Mm -hmm. And you're just, but you know, you're looking for your son. You don't know where your son is. Yeah. I, I really thought I was going to die. I mean, everything pointed to that when I'm pinned to the ground, I can't lift anything but my head and I'm panning the scene and I have no idea what's happened. I just know that it is evil. There is something evil among us because people's body parts are laying on the ground, not attached to them. I look down and my left leg is on fire. My bones are laying next to me on the sidewalk. There's I'm in a pool of my own blood and all of the things that were in those bombs are now in all of us and laying all around. And so I, I just remember looking up at the sky and basically bargaining with God. I'm like, Hey, no, I I'm okay to die if that's what it takes, but let me know that Noah is okay. And right around that time, I mean, another, I just see all of these miracles in the story because I shouldn't have been able to hear my little boy. Later, I found out both of my eardrums were blown out as well. I lost now a hundred percent in my left ear and about 30% in my right. And I shouldn't have been able to hear him screaming, but so vividly I heard, mommy, mommy, mommy. And later on, when I went back to the trial, I actually witnessed the videotapes of him saying the same words oh that God. I remember. So this was a real thing. And, and he was in the arms. I looked to the right of me and he's in the arms of a police officer. And I can see that his leg was damaged and he ended up having a cut to his bone that they were able to stitch up. But I knew that he was going to be okay. And that part of it was like, oh my gosh, you know, God just answered my prayer. My little boy is here and fine, but I'm not ready to die yet. I, you know, what have I done with my life? And, and you really do sit there and everything kind of flashes before you. And I'm in this extreme pain, but I'm in this shock. And then I'm at this place where I'm like, I've got more to do. I have taken every moment so far for granted and I haven't even realized it. And I promise that if I get out of this, however possible, I'm never going to live the same way again. Yeah, that's that's powerful stuff right there, Rebecca. <laughs> and, you know, that's uh, it's something that so many of us, it takes something so in incredible you know, or of a giant magnitude in our lives to have that moment where we, where we wow. realize that the world is so busy and so rushed and so stressed and so loud and noisy and full of stuff that it's so easy for all of us to get so disconnected and detached from what truly matters, what's truly important and put things in perspective. So 
you have all that perspective hitting you at what may be, you know, quote, too late at that point in your 26 years. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you've carried that perspective into your life now. And just from knowing you the short time I have, I can see that you live that every day because you still have. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, it's one of the things that I love about being around you and knowing you is that, you know, it, it comes and it goes, but it's still possible once you have that moment, that epiphany, which I've had in my life more than once, sometimes it starts to fade a little if I don't nurture it uh, and maintain it. It's easy to get sucked back in. And you helped me reconnect to that, I think probably at a time when I was starting to sort of lose touch with it a little bit. So, you know, I thank you for that. Um, let's talk a little bit now about, you know, the aftermath and recovery and everybody, I know it's an, an interesting story. Rebecca's telling it so compellingly. I'm not going to make her walk through this whole story here. Now I'm going to encourage you again to, to get her book and read that whole part of it because there's so much more to her story than the pain and the trauma and the tragedy. And I really want to move into that part now so that mm -hmm. we don't all miss out on that. I mean, you have a, a very long recovery in the hospital which is, you know, yeah. weeks and weeks and weeks of bed rest. And ultimately you make the decision. What was it like a year or so, a year or so later? Yeah. So initially I spent 56 days in the hospital and then I was able to go back to my parents' house because I could no longer even take care of myself. I was completely bedridden on 34 medications a day. And when I was able to get up and do anything, it was in a wheelchair. I mean, I had my sister washing my hair. I thought about that memory the other day, and it was just so special to me that my little sister was, was taking the time to do that. Um, but ultimately it led to an, a year and a half of surgery after surgery of all of these different contraptions, because I became the person that everyone wanted to fix. You know, my doctors didn't want to have to have me lose my leg from the marathon. So many people ha got amputated right then and there, and they decided to do a process called limb salvage. And they said, you know, we just want to try, even though I looked like a shark's leftover lunch, I had 80% of the bones and, and tissue in my leg and foot completely gone. I had a hole blown through my left foot where they then took back muscle from my left part of my back to put down in my foot. You know, I'm not at all bitter about that now when it's so hard to work out this side of my body because I no longer even have that part there. but. It's, uh, you know, I, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's like, I know at the end of the day that I tried everything I could to save my leg. Doctors right. wanted to, I was okay with it. And at the very beginning, when they came in my hospital room and they said, Rebecca, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. The good news is you're alive. The bad news is it's going to take a really long time to piece you back together. That was something that I had to accept right yeah. away. And my response to that is my leg is not my life and whatever happens I will deal with and I will give myself grace while doing it. And I will be thankful and show gratitude every single day for just being able to have the pain at all. And so that's really what stuck with me. And when it ultimately came time 18 months later and my doctor and I sat down and we said, it's, it's time to amputate. We've done everything. And I, I said, it was like a bad boyfriend. I needed to get it out of my life for good. And so I wrote a breakup letter. We had a going away party for my left leg and everyone was like, you know, probably horrified. But to me, you know, there was no sense in putting my family through any more pain and suffering and stress. I wanted to make it a, a fun thing and that this was going to be a new chapter of life. <laughs> Let's make it a fun thing. All right. <laughs> I love that you're you're like, I got to get my leg cut off. Let's make it fun. I mean, that's, that's crazy. But look, so I'm going to, you just said a lot of things and I've been taking notes. So I'm going to break this down because a couple of questions popped, a couple of areas that I want to dig into you here with a little bit. Um, yeah. you're, you're awfully positive when you talk about this now, which is incredible and awesome. And, you know, you say it so lightly, let's like make cutting my leg off fun. Uh, that's, <laughs> I mean, it's hilarious to me because I, I get the kind of humor and mindset. However, I also know that there are people that could be listening that think, well, I don't know how to make that 
fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't make that fun. Did, did this lady never struggle? Like, was it just a piece of cake for her? Did she just not, was it not a big deal for her? Did it come so easily? Did it come so easily to you to make light of it, to make the best of it, to focus on those blessings? Or did you have moments where you were struggling to do that? I certainly had moments where I was struggling. I remember one of the first nights being at my parents' house from the hospital. I I left these four blank confining walls and all of the comfort and safety of the hospital room. And as soon as we left, PTSD, trauma, whatever you want to call it, entered the picture because now all of a sudden, I think everyone around me is trying to get me and, and kill me and attack me. I didn't want my mom to stop for gas on the way home because I was so scared that something was going to happen to her. And then we get to the house and the familiar sounds of my mom's dog barking, my sister playing, you know, all of these different things that should have been very welcoming and very natural in my life was now something that I could barely stand. So I, I remember thinking, you know, I cried out to God one night and I said, why did you stare or spare me? Why did you spare me? And how am I going to live the rest of my life like this? Because I can't, like, I can't do this. And so there were definitely moments of time where I doubted my ability to continue on. And I think that everyone has those moments, but I also know now just with the growth that I have gone through in the past several years, that you have to have those moments of feeling every single emotion so that you're able to truly heal. And I do think too, part of my acceptance, because I have been probably better at handling the amputation part of it and the physical part, just because I feel like I've been prepared for this my entire life through abuse as a child, through different things that I've gone through. And I think that it all equipped me to handle Boston as best as I could. Yeah. Well, since you brought it up and we, I, we don't have to go into crazy detail, but let's just, let's just tick off a list, shall we? <laughs> of all, all the crazy, all the intense things that you experienced just leading up to that moment on your 26th birthday weekend. You just mentioned one of them, but let's just give people a little backdrop to those things and, and to who you were when you hit the street that day. Uh, well, I grew up as an evangelist daughter, and so my dad was very well known and would travel all over the world preaching, but he would come back home and beat me and my mom. And so from a very young age, trauma entered my life, and then it just kind of was crazy from there. All of these other things, I was I'm very sick in high school. Uh, with a condition called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. I had a car accident with a deer where the deer went through my windshield and lodged his antler into my wrist. I still have the scar today. One of many now, (laughs) my battle wounds. And uh, six months prior to Boston, I got held up in a Walmart parking lot and robbed at gunpoint. So I thought those were going to kind of be the highlights of my life. And you know, it's one of those things like hold my beer. I felt like (laughs) someone would say... (laughs) Yeah. That, and that quote always cracks me up. <laughs> it does. And so I, I really just want to bring that up, A, to give people a little more perspective on you. But B, it's another teaching point for me because I remember even like when my husband was killed, I was like, I mean, you know, devastated and all, and all these things. But somewhere in the back of my head, I was like, well, at least that's it. Like you go through your whole life. Everyone's like something bad is going to happen to everybody. I was like, well, you know, that's the bad thing. And there was this feeling in me that nothing else bad would happen because I'd already been through something so terrible and I was struggling with it so much and it just never really occurred to me. I mean, part of me was terrified. If I, if, if I called somebody and they didn't pick up or if I missed somebody's call or they weren't there and I was supposed to call them, I thought that they were dead and I would go into a panic, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So I had a lot of that stuff going on and a lot of like hy- hyper vigilant, all these other things, but it never really... I don't think it like grasped me. I used to still part of me would say, well, you know, nothing terrible could probably really happen again. So there was part of me that waged a war thinking something bad was going to happen every minute and then something and then I made it through and I was like, okay, well, you know, nothing bad will happen again. But, you know, lightning strikes twice and three times and four times and five or six or 12 times maybe, you know, 
Um, so I just think that that, I don't know, that for me is like an awakening point too, where you make it through one thing and there's a balance between sitting back and thinking, okay, I made it and relaxing back into life again, but then over relaxing and thinking that you're quote safe, you know, from anything else yeah, that's that, happening. That's a really fascinating yeah. dynamic to me, because I think that I guess the way that I grew up and I experienced hardship from a very young age that I kind of anticipated bad things happening. It wasn't that I was waiting for them necessarily, but it was just kind of like, I knew that it would happen. And I think that through this, I've really just learned to kind of cut the expectations out that my life is going to be easy. And it allows me to handle what I have on a daily basis, as far as pain and more surgeries and things like that to, I mean, it's it just a little bit easier, I guess it's yeah. a little more doable. And I, I think it's one of my coping mechanisms. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. I, you know, I, I learned the lesson the other way. I learned that bad things do continue to happen and bad things continue to happen in my life for a long time. Finally, I was like, okay, like I get it. I lesson learned. Like I get it. Like life is not going to be easy. Yeah. I'm cool. I got that. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but you know, that was the lesson. Anyway, that's a whole other topic, but that's just interesting because I know a lot of people will come to me and say, but I already had this happen. Like how much is going to happen? Why is so unfair? And they get caught up in this is so unfair that bad things keep happening to me or around me and it's not my life. And then they, you know, you can lose the ability to separate the difference between things that happen in your life and things that you create and allow to happen in your life. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. That can lead to, you mentioned your leg was like, like a bad boyfriend and you wanted to break up with him, right? Um, that's <laughs> a great illusion because you did have that relationship that, was not that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's just go into that a little bit because there's a lot more lessons to be learned there. Uh, you're in that relationship. This was the boyfriend that you went to the marathon mm -hmm. with that you had all these red flags in your head. You yeah. I've, them. You know, I think that sometimes you you kind of rely on people to give you what you're looking for in yourself. And I, I just keep thinking, you know, as we're talking about this, cause it's not something I, I think about a lot anymore. Um, I didn't know who I was getting involved with and I, I didn't know him. I didn't know where he really stood on a lot of different things. And then you add the trauma of going through something like a terrorist attack. And then we have media coming at us and we're all of a sudden this fairy tale couple from all of this horrific stuff. Everyone wanted to believe that we were meant to be. I wanted to believe we were meant to be because when I'm laying in a hospital bed and I have all of these decisions I'm having to make as far as whether or not to amputate my leg that day and all of these people coming in and, and picking bits of shrapnel out of my body and all of these teams. And I just didn't have time to think about maybe not being in the healthiest relationship. Like for me, that was a part of my life that I had had before and everything else looked so unrecognizable to me. And so I just wanted to cling on to what was anything familiar whether it was good for me or not. And so I, because I, I walked through this whole journey of just feeling so devastated, so humiliated. It was a very public thing. And it, I finally have come to the realization. And I think that that comes from the growth of it is that I, I just didn't know. And I did what I needed to do at the time. Yeah. So you said that it was very public and this was a public sort of moment where you were swooped up into this whirlwind romance on TV. You had this extravagant paid for wedding that was in the media and everybody else got to feel a little bit better. Like, oh, Rebecca's happy now. You know, OK, mm -hmm. it's good. Isn't this amazing? But behind the scenes was a completely different story. What is that like to get to that point? A lot of a lot of people deal with that now, even on social media, they post something about themselves and they just get attacked and harassed and 
labeled and judged and people are quick to judge today. How did you get to the place where you were able to just set aside what you knew was going to be the court of public opinion on you in some ways? How did you get to that place where you were confident enough in yourself and in what you needed to do for yourself to be able to just accept that that was going to happen and not let it stop you from doing what you needed to do and end that relationship? Yeah. I think if I would have stayed in a relationship that I knew was bad for me, was toxic in my life, then I would have taken everything that I learned from the day that I almost died and thrown it out the window. I learned that my life is short and every single moment of it is absolutely precious. And I want to spend it on things that are going to bring me joy and fulfillment and the people around me. And I want to surround myself with people that are are going to be positive influences on the life that I want to lead and be willing to to want to bring the same hope and encouragement and inspiration to others. And so we, we talk a lot about taking care of ourselves. And it often, we'd often talk about exercise and different things, but it all, it's, it's everything. Right. And I think you and I had a conversation the other day on our clubhouse meeting where it's, it's what we consume. It's who we hang around. It's what we spend our time doing that really make or break our lives. And so I knew that for me, this was never going to work. This was never going to be the person that was going to love me the way that I deserved to be loved, that we all deserve to be loved because I knew that I was giving all of myself and not getting the same in return. And so, you know, it was, it was a decision that I had to make to really cut out what was holding me back. And unfortunately it was my leg and (laughs) my, my home life. So yeah, that's great. (laughs) You just made that break and made that decision. But you know, in some way, once you get to the point, I imagine of something so severe as cutting your leg off, um, you're like, you're cutting you out. Like I just cut my freaking leg off. You think I can't cut you out? Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, and it was, it a was little a little liberating easier. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It does help you like, well, if I, you know, if I lost this and I'm here today, pretty sure I can lose that and still be here today too. You know, so there is sometimes something a little freeing about realizing that you can withstand things that are painful. Uh, Well, and when you have to ask the person that you're with, if they even love you, no, it, it's really one of those things, you know, that you're not with the right person. Yeah. And, and so it was a very easy decision, especially when, you know, everything happened and I I found out that he was doing other things. And now I I knew that this could not be the person that God designed me. And I do believe that we all have soulmates and people that we're meant to be with. And you found yours. I did. And if I hadn't cut out (laughs) what was holding me back, I would have never done that. So yes, I took the very long, hard road, but I am so thankful every day that I did. Yeah. And so now you are in a place that is really everything that you could have imagined building it up to be when you were It's almost like everything that you were praying for when you were laying there and healing and trying not to die, you've fought your way to, but it has not been an easy, an easy way to get there. And you still, do you still have lingering health issues from all of this today that you're dealing with? Is it like you're done and you're over that part? Are you still dealing with complications? I deal with complications. Oh, sorry. Other than the fact that you have no leg and you have to like, you know, besides that. I deal with complications <laughs> from it on a daily yeah. basis. And one of the, I mean, one of the things that goes back to expectations is you know, I knew that just by amputating my leg, I wasn't getting rid of my problems. And so 
there are going to be surgeries probably for the rest of my life because I still have hundreds of pieces, if not thousands of metal shrapnel in my body. And sometimes that's an easy surgery as outpatient. As soon as it comes to the surface, we just pick it right out. And other times it puts me back and I can't walk for three to six months. And uh, recently I had a very bad health scare and they ended up finding shrapnel near my heart that I wasn't even aware that was there. So this is an ongoing thing. And I think that it's it's easy to think of of situations the way you you said that you did in the beginning where we're like okay this horrible thing happened but now I'm I've, I'm good forever right. right but we're not and we live in a very unjust world and a very imperfect world and so the things are going to happen continually and I'm not naive to think that life is a fairy tale after a tragedy like this but when you cling on to the good stuff in your life and you really focus on your blessings and not your problems you know, I wake up every morning and I reach for a prosthetic leg or a wheelchair But with that comes the daily reminder of how short my life is and how I want to spend it loving on my, on my husband and my kids and enjoying everything that it has to offer. Yeah. Awesome stuff. So with that and all your, the fact that this is not a one and done thing. And I think when I was talking before, I think that was really more what I was getting at. I just remember thinking, all right, I did it. Like, can we just be good now? Can it go? Can it stop hurting now? Like I'm here, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to. Can the pain stop? (laughs) Can can we just stop feeling pain now? But you know, that's not how it works. Like there's no check mark that you pass the test and all of a sudden the pain goes away or the problems go away. You know, so you really just have to learn how to rise to them every day. But now considering the fact that this is something, and again, with the obvious point that you have to reach for the wheelchair or the leg every day. Like that's clearly something that is just with you for the rest of your life. But the other things that people can't necessarily see that you've just described, and we're going to get into the other parts about the PTSD and the trauma here in a second. But when you have to go through all that, including the trauma and including seeing your son walk through that path of trauma as well, what is it like to you to have to, we're coming up on the anniversary of this moment here pretty soon. Um, I don't know if uh, we'll see what kind of media exposure it gets when there's so much you know competition in the world for for all this media attention now. But even before then, or if it gets them, what is it like to see that person or that event replayed in the news? And to you know, you had to watch that. There's video of your child being carried away. Uh, what is mm-hmm. that like to have to go through all this in such a public platform? Uh, it's April's always a really weird month for me because April 15th is the anniversary of the bombing. We're coming on eight years, which is just crazy because yeah. sometimes it feels like it happened yesterday and other times it feels like just a, just such a, another life. Uh, but, and it's also my birthday. So my birthday is April 12th. And so it's like this celebration of, of life and another year here. And then three days later, we have this, you know, anniversary and anniversaries are always weird, right? Like they're sad. You're thankful to be here, but then you're sad for the people that don't get to be here. And it's such a responsibility to live in honor of those people. And it's, it's just very confusing. And I also try to just avoid it sometimes and do things that are completely not anniversary related. We went to the zoo last year and especially now in the media, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the remaining bomber because his, his death penalty got overturned and now it's been taken to the Supreme court again. So there's a lot of chatter about it and there's been a lot of people reaching out, but I just, I think that for me at this point in my life, it no longer affects me the way that it used to. Because I remember back when I had to testify at the trial and I I saw the lack of remorse on his face. I saw where he was leaning back in his chair and cracking jokes with his attorney and she's rubbing him on the back. And you know, here's this guy who's proud of what he's done while the victim's families come in and rehash losing the people that they love and the other survivors having to just tell all of the horrific things that is, is a result of what he's done. So I, I got angry, I think for the first time when that happened, 
but I was able to kind of channel that anger and go back and give a victim impact statement. And I got to tell him to his face, looking at him in the eyes. And I said, I'm not your victim. And I was asked to give a statement, but in order to do that, I would have to be your victim. And that point in my life was just a turning point for me. And so the news about him no longer bothers me the way that it used to, I think. Does that make sense? I feel like that was a little long one. No, (laughs) it does. It does make sense. And, you know, the death penalty is another hot issue. And before I was involved in the death penalty case, for me, I was always, I didn't think about it. It just didn't seem real to me. So I was like, yeah, death penalty, good. You know, death penalty, good. Um, But now when you even setting aside the, any moral issues that, that come with the death penalty, there's the other side for the victim's families or the survivor's families that they don't think about when they think about death penalty. And that is, there is, you know, some level of peace to be had when somebody's sent to prison for a life sentence and they're just, you know, they're going to be in prison with no parole mm-hmm. or anything like that. And you can just lock them away and forget about it. But with the death penalty, there's always appeals, there's always options. And in our case, there's the potential that the volatility of the death penalty itself may thwart the trial so badly that they're acquitted because it just distorts every and allows for such extra manipulation in the courtroom right. when there's a death penalty involved. So in your case, I think that's another issue. You know, maybe if he had just been given a life sentence with no parole, this wouldn't be an issue. He would just be locked away. Nobody would care about him. You forget him about it. But now he just keeps resurfacing and resurfacing. And it's like just another. So on the surface, it's like, yes, he should get the death penalty, but that's just not the way. It goes, but that too is another topic which I get a little wound <laughs> up in. So, so okay. many topics, so many topics, Rebecca. So the victim statement, I had that on the on my list here to talk about. To imagine if for a second, Rebecca, do you ever imagine your life, and not in a bad way, like oh, you know, what if, whatever, but do you ever stop and think about how different your world would be today if you had not got on that plane? And can you? Oh, ever absolutely. Just- yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I have no idea where I would be right now. <laughs> right. Can life. you imagine? I mean, clearly that guy wasn't right for you anyway. So, mm-hmm. but like, isn't it crazy? Just, you know, you think you're headed one way and then like off, off on another trajectory. Yeah. It's why it's real. It is really wild. I, I tried not to think too much about it just because it kind of gets you kind of go down a rabbit hole and you're like, well, I mean, I was so close to not making that decision. But then I also think about it too. People always ask me, would I go back before the bombing? And my answer for so long was yes, absolutely. I'd go back and not have to put my son through that and all of, but, and now, you know, as much as I didn't want him to be exposed to that at five years old and his innocence stripped away from him and everything we've endured. The fact that, you know, my husband adopted my son and we had this other beautiful baby, Riley, who's now almost five years old. And now we have our foundation that we get to help so many families going through their own trauma. It's like, you know, what, what would I have missed? Right. in terms of ultimate purpose for my life if that didn't happen and so it's a weird thing it is weird no, right it's, you, yeah you'd never wish you know oh yeah this was wonderful yeah. <laughs> yeah. but like you ha- I and i think that you have to look at the blessings and so that's what i look at what what good has come from this yeah Love that. All right. So let's get into, let's get into the good now. Let's get into, you know, we have the good, we have your husband, we have your kids and that's great. And you just mentioned your organization, Rebecca's Angels. I love this. I swear when I read your book and I saw that about you and when I hopped online and saw that about you, that just connected with me so profoundly on so many levels, what you're doing is uh, literally setting, you're providing people uh, the tool and equipment they lead. You're not changing their lives for them, but you're allowing them the opportunity to change their lives for themselves in this place where they wouldn't have before. I cannot love it enough. Please tell us about Rebecca's Angels and, and what you're doing. Well, Rebecca's Angels came from me frantically searching on Google how to help my son in the aftermath of the bombing. He was five. And so at 
all of a sudden he didn't want to get back on his bike. He didn't want to interact in public. He didn't want to go to school. All of the things that a normal five-year-old never thinks about. And so I learned what PTSD was and what trauma was and how I had been affected by it my entire life and just didn't equate it to that. And so I started researching and trying to get help therapy wise for him and for myself. And the more that I looked into it, I realized that there were so many other families that were going through their own traumatic events and they weren't getting the healing necessary because of the cost of therapy. And we've, I feel like we've come a long way in regards to mental health, but I still feel like we have a long way to go. And I just felt like, you know, for whatever reason, that our experience was ultimately leading to something bigger. And it started off as just a few words on a paper. I want to make a difference in families' lives. And that has now been Rebecca's Angels Foundation. We were established in 2018, and we've provided funding for over 250 families nationwide. That is amazing. Amazing. Uh, So... How, what is the therapy that you do? So you fly these families in Mm -hmm. to a central place around in Florida, or sometimes you're able to connect them with a therapist closer to their home. So we use a modality called accelerated resolution therapy. And what it does is it reprocesses your most traumatic memories by hand and eye movements. And so it's a very quick modality, which we really like because it doesn't get into Um, the talk therapy portion where you just have to go in and pour out every single thing that's happened to you. And it's very effective. It's helped not only me, but my son and um, several of our board members. And so we have a database of therapists all over the country that we work with. And if there's not someone in the location that someone needs, then we'll fly them in from wherever they are to Florida to meet with our preferred therapists here. Yeah. What is some of the feedback that you get from that? Do they do the people that come into contact with your organization and get help from your organization? Do they reach back out to you and let you know how they're doing? That's the best part. We we try to follow up and make sure all of our families are doing well because once they submit an application with us on our website, it becomes our mission to help them through their healing process. And so the best parts of my day is maybe when I'm having kind of a rough leg day or something and I get an email and it says, thank you, Rebecca's Angels, you've changed mine and my family's life. And we have so many countless messages and cards and calls just saying that we would not be where we are if it wasn't for Rebecca's Angels. And I just, I, and I encourage anyone who's listening today to really think about what their experiences and their skill set and their talents can do for people because we all have our ability to change the world in one way or the other. And so it may not be an organization, but there's so many other things that we're doing. And all I did was I just wasn't afraid to step out of my comfort zone. And I think you talk a lot about that, you know, not being afraid to step out of your comfort zone. So, and do the things that scare us. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Cause What's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to fail. People are going to laugh at yeah. you. You're going to you waste some time. <laughs> like, it, but exactly. it's not even a waste of time. If you're pursuing something that you believe in and you're learning and you're growing along the way, that's not a waste of time. You know, failures and setbacks, they're not a waste of time if you absorb the lessons learned and you grow along the way, uh, no matter how much it costs you in time or money. If you're learning and you're growing and you're impacting others and evolving, that's just, that's called life, I think. So that's how I view it. Uh, look, what is something that it takes, talk about what it takes to keep that organization running. Because I know, and as much as I would hope that if somebody is listening and needs help, that they find the courage and strength to reach out to you guys for help. I hope almost maybe even a little bit more that somebody maybe finds the inspiration to call you up and support your organization because it's not cheap what you're doing. It's grueling work to run a nonprofit and fund it, especially now with so much turmoil in the country and so many people tightening up their wallets and their bank accounts being depleted, it's hard to get donations, hard to get support. So if somebody out there is sort of on the fence 
about maybe supporting Rebecca's angels. Maybe they could find your website, Rebecca. Let's start with there. Where's the web- website where they can find you and find out more yeah. about your, your organization? It's, it's Rebecca's angels.org and Rebecca is spelled R E B E K A H. And we definitely need any types of donations and sponsorships. It takes about $3,000 to put a family through that lives in Florida. And so you have to think about like airfare and the travel and hotel. So it, it gets very costly, very quick. Um, but we have had some wonderful people supporting us. And one of the things with COVID is all of our events were shut down as many nonprofits were, but we were still, we still had our best year because of people just being absolutely amazing. But our applications have now increased too, because our world is living a collective trauma. And there is a lot um, in the aftermath of that. So we're experiencing an influx of applications, which we will always have more applications than we do funding. Yeah. And that's hard. Is it hard to have to say to people, Hey, we can't help you right now it's heartbreaking yeah yeah to put somebody on i guess that was list. a dumb question is it hard to tell somebody no i can't help you that was a dumb question i take it back that's that's like coming up to somebody like after something terrible happens and saying how do you feel how does it make sure? so i'm gonna just walk that question back a little bit sometimes i do that but, but that reminds me of like when the media was trying to get into oh our hospital God. rooms they're posing as our family members to try to get an interview and one of the first interviews i had was someone said you know, so how are you feeling and i i just kind of looked at him like how how do you think i'm feeling i just found out that i was um, involved in a terrorist attack uh, and I'm laying here and I don't know what my life is going to look like moving forward. So I know. it's just, it's always funny. I think people, sometimes the questions are just, they're the hilarious. <laughs> God love it. I just did the same thing. So I can't talk, but not to the, I remember we all do after two, I had two strikes at bat and then people were like, Barb shouldn't talk to the media anymore because I had one reporter call. I answered the phone and she's, and this was like within a couple of days after my husband, I just found out he was murdered. Blah, blah. They're like, how are you doing today? Did you get up? I mean, you know, did you take care of your kids today? What'd you do? I'm like, did I take care of my kids today? I'm like, no, I left them in the filthy diapers and told them to fend for themselves. And I hung up on them and everybody is like, who was that? I'm like, I don't know. I think it was like channel five or something. Like, I'm like, did I take care of my kids? Oh my God. I had a couple of those moments and then people were like, maybe Barb should not be talking to the press. So what are you going to do? But yeah, so all that's stemming from me also asking a dumb question. But I think it's also important because I know what it can be like when somebody does apply for help or reach out, that's a gigantic thing to them. And it can be a setback or it can feel bad, or maybe there could be some bitterness or maybe it could get, I don't, do you get bad reviews from people who are like, they said they could help, but they turned me down. Does that ever happen? We haven't yet. Uh, so that's, that's really that's good. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's, you know, most of the time, and this kind of goes with everything, you have to be ready for a change in your life and you have to be willing to put in the work to do it because therapy is not a fix all thing. No, you have to, you have, it's just as much your responsibility to really put in the work to do the things that you need to do in order for the therapy to work too. So, um, we've, we've had a really great season with this. And I'm just, I just remain so humbled and thankful. And we're really serious about what modalities we use too. And it, it stems from what has worked for me too, because I go through everything myself and it just, it was life-changing for me. So when I went from being scared to death to even sit next to a backpack at the airport because I automatically assumed it had a bomb in it and not being able to have fireworks and s'mores with my kids or go to Disney because of the crowds. You know, and and now I can do all of that and more. There's there's something to it. And so yeah. we you get um, your life back. You get your life back when you do that. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Is there something did I see that the governor or, or I mean was it his wife or was it DeSantis? Who put it out there in Florida that there's an initiative that they're looking to to help kids? First Lady DeSantis is doing a, a kid's initiative. And then also Mrs. Pence talked about it at one of the 
town hall me. I, I can't remember exactly what she said, but she endorsed accelerated resolution therapy. So it is getting out there to a lot of people and it's becoming a really widely used thing. And it's really neat because existing therapists, practicing therapists and social workers can just add it to their toolbox. And so the company that we work with our international and who supplies our database, they go around and they train different therapists that want to incorporate it into their services. So it's really amazing how much it's grown and how people have really had their lives changed because of it. Would you be open if one of those people called you from one of their offices, DeSantis's or Pence, say the phone rings and it's one of them. Hey, Rebecca, I heard about your organization. Would you be interested in working with us? Would that be something you'd jump on or oh, not so much? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, okay. I'm, I am all about, you know, first of all, telling people that it's okay to hurt and have pain and that you don't have to go through it yourself. I think there's been such a stigma around mental health in, in the earlier, I mean, just even now that I've seen so many more commercials about it and things because of COVID, which has been really eye opening for a lot of people. But I think that there's still people that struggle with that. And you want to, you want to put on this strong persona and nothing's going to get to me, but really, you know, if we're not right mentally, then we can't be right physically. We can't show up as our best selves in the world. And I'm very open and transparent and vulnerable about my own PTSD journey. And that's where it comes from. It's my heart and soul because it's changed my life. And so now I just want to change as many others as I can. I love you. And anyone listening, if you think that she can't possibly be like this, like for real, I'm telling you, she just is. She's just like this. For real. Thank you. She's just fun and genuine. I strongly, strongly encourage everyone to hop on, follow her on Instagram. Rebecca, where can they find you on Instagram? Um, my social media handles are Rebecca M. Gregory. So I'm most active on TikTok and Instagram. TikTok too. <laughs> right. I forgot about TikTok because I'm not a, I'm not, a, I'm not a TikToker, but uh, yes, definitely TikTok. That's, that's where all the fun is, I guess. Facebook, and on Instagram. I guess. Yeah. 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 And you're also on Clubhouse. So let's get into that for a little bit. You have one room on Fridays with your friend, Jessica Buchanan, get into that room for a little bit. Yep. So that's a fierce female Friday. We do a room and it's just uh, entrepreneurs and people that want to just show up as, as the best versions of them in life. And we just kind of go over all kinds of different topics. It's been really fun. I'm doing it with my friend, Jessica Buchanan, who is, was kidnapped by Somali pirates and she has her own incredible story. And so that's an honor for me. And then also Barb and I do a clubhouse room on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. called Train Your Pain. And clubhouse has just been neat because you have conversations. And I think that the, that's what social media has been missing and lacking a little bit because we get too involved with all of these filters and aesthetically pleasing posts right. that we, we don't get raw and real anymore. So I've enjoyed clubhouse. Yeah, I don't really spend too much time on aesthetically pleasing posts. I'm just like, whoop, here we are. But, you know, once again, that has its oh, there's my dogs just going to bark for us because why not? Okay, look, yes. And as you mentioned, we do the train your pain room. We're looking into changing that time and date, perhaps. If Tuesday at 10 is people seem to be struggling, we're getting a lot of messages for that. So go ahead and message either me at Barbell and Speaks on Instagram or Rebecca on Instagram. Let us know what time works for you or pop in and or pop in Friday mornings to her room with Jessica Buchanan. That's a really cool room as well. Jessica's amazing. Like Rebecca said, she's got her own incredible story. Rebecca, thank you so much. And let's not sign off here before we talk about our women's event here that we are planning to come yes. together. This live event, uh, right? It looks like it's going to be in Texas. I have a good feeling. I have a call at the venue this afternoon. I have a good feeling it's going to be in Texas. And if anybody's wondering why she lives in New York, she lives in Florida. Well, New York sort of you know, is a little short on freedom these days. I'm just going to say it like that. But uh, they're a little short on freedom these days. So, you know, no masks and social distancing in this event. Florida, we're looking to too, but it's scarcity there. It's really difficult to find the place yeah. to, to everybody's coming like to Florida. It's crazy yeah. right it's now. It's really tough here. to find a venue that'll allow us to do this event in Florida. Listen up, ladies. We are gonna do this event. And Rebecca, I showed you the venue and I have more to tell you about it later on, the, the venue possibility that I have a call with, right? It is going to be 
badass, but like not in the fluffy kind of, I'm a badass, work a sweat up on the beach and then go to the spa kind of day. No, we're going to kick your asses a little bit. And right there, we're going to get our asses kicked along with you. We're going to do some uh, Krav Maga, some self-defense training. We're going to do some firearms training. We're going to do some hardcore personal development work, bringing in some women who have amazing stories and lessons personally and professionally. I have a friend who has another story that just drops your jaw every time she speaks another sentence comes out. You just can't believe that she went through all this and endured. And then she wound up achieving professional success where she bought the company that once fired her for making too much money. We're bringing in all of these powerful, amazing, strong women to spend three days with us, probably in Texas at this point, over the summer, we hope, or early fall. And we are going to get into it, right? We're going to really just do the things that I know I wish I had had years ago that would change my life. So Rebecca's going to keep you posted on that on her page and her social media. I'm going to keep you posted Mm -hmm. on mine. And if you have questions, you want to be a part of it, you better get in. We're going to start opening up spots here soon to, uh, to lock this all in. We're only taking about 30 women and not just any 30 women. You can't just say, I think I want to go and pay the money to go and then not be the right fit for this. So we have to make sure you're a good fit for this because who wants to waste your time or money coming out to be with us if if we're not a good fit for you, right? Absolutely. So right. that's it. That was my last minute babbling. Rebecca, is there anything that, I mean, there's so much about your story, like I said, we couldn't get into because it's just so layered and in-depth. And I really wanted to hit on all the points, all the amazing, incredible things you're doing and just get your energy forth more than anything else but is there anything that you'd like to bring in that we didn't get it we didn't get to touch on here I don't think so the most important thing for me is Rebecca's angels so I appreciate just the time that you allowed me to talk about that because it it really does you know I I do believe pain to purpose you had seen my sign fell but I, I believe that our pain in life leads us to our ultimate purpose but we have to be willing to accept the things that are sometimes out of our control and do do what we can with the ones that are in our control. Because I look back on my journey and I think about all the decisions that I could have made differently that would have led me to a completely different place. And there's some things that I brought on myself and I'm okay with saying that now. And it's, it's a process, right? We're always learning. We're always evolving, but life is, is so beautiful and it's worth it. It is. Thank you so much. And let me just mention too that we're going to donate a portion of our proceeds to we're going to donate ten percent of the Train Your Pain event to Rebecca's Angels or more. If we do, if we're able to do more, we'll donate more than that. But we're going to start with ten percent. And again, I encourage anybody. Yes, of course, if you're struggling and you need help, check out Rebecca's Angels. She's super passionate about what she's doing and really wants to help. And if you're someone that has some money to invest or support to invest in humanity and want to get back to you know put that money to good use, please contact Rebecca's Angels and reach out to her too, or just share her site, share her page and get support for it that way. It's all word of mouth and travels around. We can all, my friend puts it, I always come back to this quote, right? She's like, we can't all save the world, but we can't all tidy up our own little corner of it. And I love that. I love love that that saying, right? And so Rebecca is tidying up her corner, her lane, her track of it. So let's go ahead and give her a hand. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And thank you for all you're doing. It's been an honor, Barb. Thanks so much.